traveled with Gary L. and Gigi's Boo here on reallibertymedia.com, RLM Radio. Hello, everyone. Hello, Gigi's Boo. How are you? I'm fine. How about you, Gary? I'm doing all right. Doing all right this week. Yeah. How's everyone out there in that chat room at RLM, reallibertymedia.com? I know it's a holiday. got a full house tonight. There's quite a few people in here considering it's a holiday. Holiday weekend. Memorial Day, a lot of people are out and about, and so probably the live views would, be, I can usually count them on two hands, but maybe it would be down to one, <laughs> one, mm-hmm. hand, one hand tonight, and you know, that's interesting in itself, I don't know, I guess it's kind of telling, I guess, I guess we're not, we're just not that professional broadcasting that people want to hear about. Gigi's boo, and that's we've been doing this what I guess eight years, something like that. Various topics, uh, yeah, various topics, various platforms, various venues. It's been okay, but I don't see a golden globe in the future. <laughs> oh, I don't either. Uh-uh. <laughs> but uh, as I said last week, it really now you know, and everyone you know likes to think that they're popular and stuff. I mean, that's just human nature. But when it comes down to it, really doesn't matter because the people who matter will will hear the message. It'll we'll be the right right message at the right time for the right person that's right and if it only affects one person along the way and i think we've probably succeeded in that at some point then it's been worth it at that level but one of the things that i did come across last night and i promised that would comment about it you know i like to watch these top fives these youtube top five different ones are pretty good stuff usually some are better than others, but there was one last night, and it was about the top five swatting episodes. And I'd never heard of swatting. Had you, had you ever heard of swatting, Gigi's boo? No, I'm swatting flies. Yeah, that's about the only swatting I know about. But apparently, there has arisen among gamers, particularly, this behavior called swatting, and it's kind of a hater type of thing that if someone's like real popular, then you will SWAT them, and by that you, you'll call the police and make up a story that they've threatened suicide or they're burning down their house or they're holding somebody hostage and the cops will come crashing into your house. And now I wonder how they get their names and addresses for real online, but I guess some people give it up like that. But where I'm going with this is it talks about the number of subscribers to these gaming channels. And the numbers are in the 50s, the 60s, the 100,000s of people who subscribe to watch other people play video games online. I'm sitting here wondering. <laughs> we have... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Go they ahead. don't play. They just watch. Well, the subscribers are just watching. Dear God. They don't have a life, do they? I don't know. I, but the point I'm trying to make here is that you have a lot of people in the independent media ourselves included that we try to bring a message every week that we think or at least we believe has some benefit to the larger community and you know we'll get 100 200 subscribers <laughs> and on the other side where we do the ufo stuff we have about seventy five thousand, and that's actually kind of telling too if you think about it it's like it goes back to that old matrix thing where the guy i can't think of his name who eats the steak and says he knows it's not real steak but it tastes so good and he'd rather have the fake steak than the ugly reality and i think that is part of what people are up against in independent media that people are by and large are overwhelmingly rope-a-doped as cassius clay muhammad ali would say they're overwhelmingly rope-a-doped they just don't want to hear it and i've had people tell me that to my face especially some of the older folks that say, I'm old and blah, 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 whatever excuse, you know, pick one. And I just don't want to hear about that. I don't want to know about that. The corollary is that they'd rather stay stupid. I don't know what to make of all that. But, like I said, there are a few people out there who do enjoy the message and they do share it. And we appreciate that. 
I don't think we're going to expect any more than that. Anyway, having said all that, you have any home front news before I take off into the news segment? Trying to think. No, I think everything's okay. We'll talk about Atticus at the end of the show. I don't know if we will or not. Atticus, <laughs> Atticus, Atticus is showing out a little bit. I don't think we're going to have any comment about Atticus. That's a kind of a tragic story in itself, as it's turned out. But that's another thing altogether. Anyhow, looking at the New York Times, the New York Times from the 16th of May, U.S. fertility rate fell to a record low for a second straight year, and it turns out they're kind of um, lowballing this. It says the country's been living through one of the longest declines in fertility in decades, and demographers are trying to figure out what is driving it. And it talks about all the potential sociological reasons that it goes on, that something's happening. They talk about numbers of births to 10 of births to 10 to 14 year old girls. What? Now only a few thousand are down from over 6,000 10 years. I don't even understand what they mean by that. I don't know what they mean by that. And it goes on as most articles do in the inverted pyramid style. And we'll just jump now though to Science Alert, which came out about a week later also reiterates the fact that new figures show that just 60.2 babies were born in 2017 for every 1,000 women of childbearing age, 15 to 44, a low not seen in the U.S. since officials began charting national birth rates decades ago. And talks about the CDC statistics show a 3% fall from the rate in 2016, the largest single-year decline since 2010, general fertility rate, or the GFR. And it goes on to talk about all the details of that. But here is one small paragraph that really got my attention. What makes this downward trend harder to comprehend is the overall population of women of childbearing age is significantly greater than it was a decade ago, with there being 7% more women aged 20 to 39 in 2017 than there were in 2007. So where the New York Times omitted the fact that not only are the numbers down, the numbers down are remarkable more so because of the increased rate of women of childbearing age. So the net effect of that would be that it's actually a larger percentage than 3%, right? Uh, Kenneth M. Johnson told the New York Times, it's one of the big demographic mysteries of recent time. And it goes on trying to justify it through postponing marriage and economic factors and all all this kind of crap. But Gigi's boo, what is going on here? What do you think is going on with this? I have no idea, but it's very strange. And the part you said about the young girls, I hope to goodness that 13 and 14 year old girls are giving birth to babies. Yeah, that was just kind of in there. That that was that, just was, that was real creepy to me. Yeah, even. and that was just kind of in the article. And I, I don't know exactly what brought that on, you know, what brought that out. Grimnir brought up something in the chat room, and he said that vaccines are driving the fertility rate down on purpose, and I agree with him. Yeah, I think I think so. I agree with him, yeah. I think so, and, and we try to put it out there for people to come to their own conclusions, but the evidence is pretty sick. There's something going on, and let me tell you, and we're going to go back to something we've talked about here in the past. And it's called Deagle.com. I'm sure you guys remember Deagle.com. We say they've been around, been charting this stuff since about 2014. And what they chart are, among many things, it's quite a, it's quite a research site. It's kind of a think tank of sorts, I guess. It's one you don't hear much about. But when you go to Deagle.com, they adjust their numbers from time to time. But what they have is a forecast for the year 2025. And they break down most countries. They break it down. It's what the situation is now, what the situation they predict to be in 2025. In the United States, they're predicting a downturn of population of about two-thirds. It actually works out to about 70% reduction in population. 70%. And the United States appears to be, based on all their numbers, appears to be the most heavily hit in that regard. Now, they talk about all their reasons about why. They talk about migration and economic collapse and all these kind of things. But that rings a little hollow to me when I look at the overall numbers worldwide where you're losing about half a billion, 500 million people worldwide. 
in a very short period of time. We're talking 2025. Now, the, over the last couple of years, they kind of tweaked the numbers a little bit. I think the last time I looked, it was uh, they predicted a U.S. population about 84 million. Now they've tweaked it up to about 100 million. But when you look at their predicted gross domestic product, it changes from $19 trillion in 2017 figures to $2.4 trillion in 2025. 19 to 2.4. That's a pretty significant drop in GDP. The people just kind of scoff at this, but I don't think so. Especially when we did the research, we talked about the fact that this is tied to a Rockefeller Foundation guy. So a government guy and also a Rockefeller Foundation guy, but I repeat myself. You can't just dismiss this. There's something, they've been predicting it since 2014. There's something coming, something that's going to drastically reduce the United States population. And as you look at the, all the charts, all the countries, it appears, at least the appearance is, that the countries that are most technologically impacted or he- technologically heavy are the countries that get hit the hardest. And conversely, the countries who are more third-worldy actually come out on a net gain in every regard. So when you do your planning, you might really want to pay attention to Deagle.com, and it's hard to get to sometimes. Sometimes it wants to act like it's not there, and you just have to keep trying various attempts to connect with the site because sometimes it just says it's not there. It doesn't exist. We'll put the link to the link that does exist. We'll put that in the chat or in the uh, blogcaster. And really look at it, study it. And as far as contingency planning goes, I mean, you might want to at least take a look at some of those third world countries. And one of the guys on a different show made the comment, he presently lives in a place like this. He said he made the decision to live in a place where people didn't have a lot because they would probably be the last to be targeted if there were a major downturn. There's something to that. There's something that there's some, makes some sense. You know, if you live in a place that's already kind of third-worldy or on the verge of being destitute, you're probably in a safe place because you already know how to operate with next to nothing. So it makes a lot of sense in that, in that way. That sounds a little radical, but so does a 70% decrease in population. That sounds a little radical too, doesn't it? What are your thoughts on that, Gigi Smith? I look at the United States, what happened here for a while, the AIDS epidemic. We were very overly populated at one time. I don't think we are now, but you don't hear anything else about AIDS, do you? It's become very quiet. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because you you keep hearing this mantra about overpopulation. And if you look at the evidence, that is not true at all. We are not overpopulated. In fact, just as those two previous reports touched on, the population is declining worldwide. Europe is experiencing the very same thing. We're seeing declining populations. But where I'm going to is based on the Deagle information. To achieve a loss of 70% in such a short period of time, we're talking about to seven years, right? Something's got to happen. There's something, that, there's something they think they know about that they've been knowing about. And it's, now it's just a matter of adjusting a few digits here or there about what they think the actual numbers will be so i don't know but moving along a little bit on the a lot of people told you so kind of news a family has to remove its alexa devices after a stranger in another town heard everything they were saying in portland oregon a concerned family speaking out after they claim that their amazon alexa device recorded a conversation they were having in their home and sent it to a random contact who alerted them to the fact that he had heard everything they said. The homeowner, named Danielle, who asked for her name to remain anonymous, told KIRO Channel 7 that she and her husband were in the house discussing home improvement projects and hardwood floors when they received an urgent call from one of her husband's employees in Seattle. The person on the other line said, Unplug your Alexa device right now. You're being hacked. We unplugged all of them, and he proceeded to tell us that he had received audio files of recordings from inside our house. At first, my husband was like, no, you didn't. And the recipient of the message said, you sat there talking about hardwood floors. And we said, oh, gosh, you really did hear us. That's scary. Yeah, well, 
And I think people have been telling you so. This total surveillance system and Amazon is who is Amazon is Alexa and Amazon is tied directly to CIA through they're building their networks. Yeah. So there you are. There's your Alexa. You want you want to, what the bottom line here, of course, people at Amazon, the customer support, I guess was overly apologetic and they had no idea how this could happen and blah 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 of course what it tells you is the takeaway here is that the alexa devices are storing everything that comes their way it comes within earshot they're storing it and they're storing it into files and just something happened there was a glitch in the system and one of the files was sent to somebody in their contact list you know, that happened to a family, something similar to this. Their child was sick, and they called in to an answering service to get in touch with the doctor. And a person that was not even a doctor had hacked into this answering service, called this family back, and told them what to do for the child. Now, that is really scary. <laughs> this, is, yeah, this is the world in which we live. This tech, as again, again, the technology heavy. And when you're technology heavy, you're technology vulnerable. What was the name of that movie that Jim Carrey played in and his old life was just a big show? Oh Pick yeah. Uh, Grimner knows. Grimner knows. It was it was a it was a play and when he found out that it wasn't real, he left. Right. And it's that's what this is reminding me of. Yeah. The Grimner will pop in the chat with it in a sec. He's the master of trivia like that. <laughs> that's what happens when you play all all Sunday you're playing the Trivial Pursuit in the chat room by the way you guys are listening you need to go to the chat room the reallibertymedia.com join the chat because lots of fun stuff going on here even when there's no broadcasting so you might just want to check it out for moving along and I guess possibly some good news it looks like MK Ultra having been decried as a conspiracy theory. Oh, nobody does things like that. Well, victims of alleged LSD brainwashing experiments in Montreal plan to file a lawsuit. Survivors and families of those who allegedly underwent brainwashing experiments at McGill University in Montreal are planning a class action lawsuit against the Quebec and federal governments because of what they claim had been done to them decades ago. And Gigi's Boo, that's the Truman Show that you were talking about. Yeah, so, that's it. Yeah, Dr. Ewan Cameron, a former, psych, former psychiatrist at McGill University Allen Memorial Institute, conducted CIA-funded experiments in the 1950s and 60s involving sleeping drugs, electroshock therapy, and powerful hallucinogenic LSD to see if the brain could be reprogrammed. MK Ultra. So those who always said that's just a conspiracy theory, Sirhan, Sirhan, all that stuff, actually along the same lines, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is now convinced that Sirhan Sirhan was brainwashed into killing RFK. He spent three hours talking to Sirhan Sirhan, in addition to having looked at all the other evidence surrounding the case. And he's come to the conclusion that Sirhan Sirhan was under mind control at the time, and he's going to try to work to have him released. So all you people say it's conspiracy theory. I don't want to hear it. Well, sorry for your luck. What about the Boy Scouts? We've all heard about the changes of the Boy Scouts, you know, this uh, cultural revolution, I guess you could say. The Leninist, Stalinist, Marxist would probably call it that. But now, according to the Daily Mail, Condoms must now be made available to all participants at the Boy Scouts Global Gathering as girls are permitted to join the organization. Boy, did we not see this coming. Oh, yeah. Rules now require that the host organization of the World Scout Jamboree provide condoms at a number of locations for staff for staff and participants during the event. That is the awfulest thing I have ever heard in my life. Yeah. It will be the first time the Jamboree is held by three national scout organizations, which will be Scout Canada, Associations of Scouts of Mexico, and the Boy Scouts of America. And this will be occurring in the mountains of West Virginia from July 21st to August 1st, 2019. International members of the Girl Guides, or Girl Scouts, as they are known in the United States, 
have been allowed to attend past jamborees if their national association had an arrangement with the World Organization of Scout Movement. But it is expected that girls will make up half of the participants attending the 2019 World Scout Jamboree. I got a question. Go ahead. What is wrong with girls wanting to be Boy Scouts? It's terrible. Why aren't they happy to be Girl Scouts or Steps just like they are in Boy Scouts? Okay, here you go. This is a breakdown in a society that's going to lead to terrible things to happen, and they're not going to be able to fix it. It's a mess. Many would argue that that's the whole point, that it's part of the takedown of the American society. Many would make that argument. And actually, that's been I, that's been forecasted. There have been people who have gone on the record saying that that is part of the planning process. And perhaps this is one of those things. But there is a little bit of an option here, if you like, something that came to my attention recently, an organization called Trail Life USA. And it is a Christian outdoor adventure character and leadership program for boys and young men operating from troops that are chartered through churches in 48 states. The K-12 through program centers on outdoor experiences that build a young man's skills and allow him to grow on a personal level and as a role model and leader for his peers. My grandfather was an Eagle Scout back years ago in the 20s and 30s maybe. I have his scout book, and I just do not see girls participating in this. Women have their place. Oh, I know I'm going to get a backlash on that. But I've always believed that women have their place, men has theirs. That's why we were created the way we were. It doesn't make a woman any less than what she is or any more than what she is to have her place. Now, I'll quit because we're going to get some backlash probably, but. Well, all five people who are listening, <laughs> maybe one maybe one will take exception to that, and I don't really care. But you're right. We were defined genetically into certain characteristics, which suggest that there are certain duties and obligations that go along with those characteristics. Having said that, I don't see any reason why Girl Scouts can't expand their experiences, so to speak, to include maybe more challenging things like the guys do. For example, if they want to play ice hockey, which is a very, very tough game. I mean, fine. That's not a problem. I don't have a problem with that. But now, me, I've always liked being a girl. That's right. You can still be a girl and be a tough girl. I don't have a problem with that. But when you start mixing people up together like this, what you're, what you're doing is just another step toward the gender removal process, where a drone is a drone. If you look at a bee colony, you have the drones, and the only female is a queen. Actually, it sounds a little bit like Star Trek, doesn't it? The Borg cube, you have drones, and they make no distinction of gender of the Borg drones. The drones are the drones. So I think that's kind of what the desired effect is here with this. You'll have the very few affluent elitists who believe that they're sitting at the top of the beehive and the rest of everyone else below will just be a bunch of drones in a nutshell. How about wood burners and bonfires are banned in Britain's homes as new pollution crackdowns prepared? Oh, no, you can't have a bonfire. You can't have a wood-burning stove. And that's, of course, to protect the nation from pollution, according to the U.K. Environmental Department. And how hypocritical is this when they, all these locations in Great Britain particularly are going through their towns and clear-cutting perfectly healthy trees in order to allow 5G to be more effective. So they don't mind cutting down all the flora but you don't want to put any smoke in the air. That, that it, It's just crazy. It makes no sense to me. And, of course, we've seen this in the United States where they try to crank down on uh, having, you have to have a catalytic converter on your wood stove and all these kinds of things. It's just, we have lost our minds. Okay, on an upswing, we talked about the civilian marksmanship program through the United States Department of Defense, how that is directly geared to maintaining a well-regulated militia. Well, it turns out that they're looking to expand the reach of their small arms firing schools beyond their normal schedule. And it talks about the different places that they're presently being held, the national matches at Camp Perry, 
travel games at Oklahoma City, Camp Butner, North Carolina, Talladega, Alabama, Camp Ethan Allen, Vermont, and Ben Avery Shooting Facility in Phoenix, Arizona. Presently, they welcome 400 to 800 attendees each year at the National Small Arms Firing School at Camp Perry as part of the national matches. As a part of our firearm safety and marksmanship mission, with an emphasis on youth, the CMP is looking for a few more qualified sites around the United States to host the classroom program of instruction and 200-yard excellence and competition rifle match to reach those who lack the time or means to travel to a current location. So long story short, if you know someone who has a facility that meets their criteria, and I'm digging right now to see their criteria, you might want to reach out and, I mean, this this couldn't hurt your business. Let's put it that way, looking at it from a businessman's perspective. They're looking for a place that has a classroom that accommodates at least 20 to 50 participants, overhead lighting, electrical outlets, projection screens, parking, restrooms, participants aged 16 and over. If you go to the federal code and the traditional qualifications to be in a militia, you'll see that the 16 is a reasonable number. They're looking for also the rifle range, which has a minimum of 10 firing points, has volunteers to make sure it's safe, has portageons and so forth and so on. A 200-yard high-power range with safety berms, range flags, easily accessible roads, trails, etc. Probably aren't a whole lot of those around, but if you know someone that has one, you can check the blogcaster and find the link for CMP. And on that same note, they're offering registration now for the June D-Day Rifle and Pistol Matches in Talladega, Alabama, from June 8th through the 10th at the Civilian Marksmanship Program's Talladega Marksmanship Park in Alabama. And I'll put the link in there for that. And they have different events. They have an M1 Garand shooting event that's part of the observance of the D-Day. If you have an M1 Garand and you would like to take part in that and you live close to Talladega, well, sure, hang, sign up. It'll be in the blogcaster. All right, I think, yeah, we pushed it right about the right split in the show. Last week, we talked about, or Jim Brennan talked about, canning. And there seemed to be some interest. <laughs> Hell, I saw that in the chat room. I'm not going to repeat it. Uh <laughs> Hell being, mm, hell, be <laughs> hell being bad in the chat room. <laughs> <laughs> and grim near too, for that matter. Okay, well, anyway, last week, Jesus, we was talking about canning, and there seemed to be some interest in the chat room. And maybe I got the indi- indication that maybe it was an area that we might need to flesh out a little bit for some of the listeners, which we're happy to do. We've talked about it before years ago. And it doesn't hurt to go over it again, especially in view of some of the things we've talked about already on the show. <laughs> you might you might be well served to learn how to operate a canner and what some of the details are. And Gigi's Boo is probably the meister. If you talk about merit badges, she probably have the canning merit badge. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> right. So anyway, so I'm going to let her take off here with talk about canning, and I'll try to pipe up occasionally as I can. Okay, Gigi's Boo, it's all you. Okay, let's touch a little bit on how long people have been canning and preserving food. The earliest record that we have has been found recently, and it was in a lake up in Canada that had stayed frozen 90% of the time, and it thawed, and so people were kind of snooping around and looking, and they found some type of cord or string that was ancient, and at the bottom, they had tied meat. And they estimate this thing to be at least two or three thousand years old. So that tells us it could have been cavemen. So cavemen knew how to preserve their food to come back and get it later. And we don't have that luxury here now. We have to do other things. I wouldn't mind living like a caveman myself. Gary and I have talked about that. But now we do it with more sophisticated utensils, sophisticated equipment, And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that. Now, I do can a great deal. I put 90% of our food up. If it has to be pressure cooked, pressure canned, I use the All-American Pressure Cooker Canner. You can cook in it, but I don't do that. I use it mainly for canning. It's 21 and a half quart. That doesn't mean that it'll hold that many quarts. It's just 
the capacity the whole thing will hold in liquid form. You can get 19 standard regular mouth pint jars in. And how you do that is you put so many on the bottom and it comes with a metal plate that has holes in it. You can stack that on top and do another row and it holds 19. That's pint jars. It'll hold seven standard regular mouth quart jars. It's really the best one that you'll ever find. It's made of durable hard cast aluminum. It's easy to clean. It's got a satin finish. It's got an easy off cover. You do not have a gasket with this. This is metal sealing on metal. Now, what you do have is you have the clamped wing nuts. And let's see, two, four, six, there's six of them. And when I put the handle, the lid and the handle together, I turn it to a certain point and then I opposite sides bring my nuts up and I tighten those. Then I'll bring the others up. Now, Gary's going to drop links for all these. When you see it, you'll know what I'm talking about. The thing that I found with this is I have tried with a Presto, and I'll talk about it in a minute, but a Presto canner does has seal. With this one, you don't have a seal, so you don't have to worry about a gasket that'll crack, burn, that you need to replace and clean. Although, at the end of the canning season, I clean this real good. I clean the vent pipe. I put a little thin layer of petroleum jelly around it to preserve it so it doesn't rust around both the top and the lid. It's very heavy duty. You, you have three settings for pressure, 5, 10, and 15 pounds. In our area, most everything is kinned on a 10 pound. If you go on out into the Colorado Rockies, you're going to have to use 15, and you'll have to up your can in time. Most things didn't take long to can this way. Green beans, somebody said, why in the world would you can green beans with a pressure canner? Well, you can use a water bath. That's a whole different system we'll talk about. But when you pressure can your green beans, when you take those things out in 20 to 25 minutes, those green beans are cooked. All you have to do is rinse them real good, put you some seasoning in them, and warm them up. You're good to go. Fish and meats are easily canned also. I do all raw pack. I don't ever do any cooked meat. I do all raw meat. You can can anything, just to tell you the truth. You really can. Now, on the meats, it's always 90 minutes here. You might go up higher like in the rockets it might take a little bit more but it's so easy to open you a can of beef stew add some potatoes to it a jar of your green beans and you got supper english peas anything that you would want this is a great canner now they are not cheap when i got mine oh so many years ago i think i gave 188 dollars for it the one that I have now is selling for two seventy nine. Now, you can find them lots of places. You can find them Amazon, Walmart. Gary's going to drop a link in the show about where you can go and find these different ones. I bought mine from Amazon. Never have regretted a minute. Love it. Wouldn't use anything else. It's very well made and it's very sturdy. If you're going to do a pint of chicken, that's going to, or, or any type of beef, venison, fish, it's going to be one pound. That's what you're going to get, one pound after it's canned. If you use a quart jar, that's going to be two pounds, with the exception of fish. If fish is not filleted and cut, where you can just put it in, you're not going to get that much out of it. You're going to get about maybe two to three fish in there that's squeezing it in and what we do is we scale our fish but we leave the bones in because that gives you a little bit of extra calcium now on the presto cooker it's a lot more well i don't want to say cheap but it really is it's not as good as the all-american the presto is thinner aluminum it'll heat quicker you can probably can faster but you are really going to have to watch it because you are going to constantly burn those seals up. It also has a pressure gauge on it so you could follow it. It also has a dial on it that you can dial the pressure. On the All-American, it's got the pressure. You just turn it different ways and look and see if you want 15. 
it's already on there. The holes are there. You just drop it down on it. They have said that the only method safe for canning with the USDA, boo, I don't pay any attention to them, is pressure canning. I'll accept my fish, my meat, stuff like that. I, I, I do agree with them on that. You have to do that. I'll, one thing, and we'll talk about that. The Presto has a kind of a clamp, and you just kind of clamp it on, and then I was always afraid of it. It didn't have the extra little vent on the top in case something went wrong. You'll blow a gasket. You know, you'll blow it, and it'll just blow everywhere. I want to tell you, though, that if you do can, please pay attention to your canner. Read all the instructions on how to use it. Do a dry run with nothing but water. With this All-American, I can put seven quarts in. I put about two inches of water in the bottom. I put my lid on. Then I'll bring the steam up through the vent where the, the pressure gauge goes. It must steam for 10 minutes. That way you're sure you're going to get it hot enough when you put that gauge on it. It's going to rise to 10 pounds of pressure. As soon as that happens and it starts jiggling and making the little hissing, jiggling sound, whatever you are cooking and canning, you start timing it at that moment. So say I was doing quarts of chicken and I heard that first jiggle and then another little jiggle. I know then to start timing. I would time 90 minutes. Now, I always stay with my canner. I never leave the room. I stay with it. And that's a good time to catch up on a good book. You could be washing dishes, or if you want to, you could be snapping beans, shelling peas, whatever you need to do, do that. Between the hassle, I don't like the hassle of having to try to find a gauge. And I don't like it because it does can really, really fast. You also are going to need canning utensils. Gary will drop a site in for that, too. You're going to need a funnel. You're going to need some tongs. You're going to need what I call a little stick that you bring the bubbles out. You stick it down into your fruit or whatever to get the bubbles out so it wouldn't take up too much space. You'll need a timer, too, if you not, don't have a watch. I usually just use my watch. I don't have a timer. I set the time, and I look, and I go from there. You're going to need a funnel. You're going to have to have a funnel to put your stuff into the jar. And you never fill it up to the rim. You always leave about an inch and a half head space. That way, you know that everything has had room to expand and move around a little bit. Then you can cut it. When, when your time's off, you cut the canner off. Do not remove the gauge, the pressure gauge. Let the pressure come down by itself. It will come all the way down. When you say pressure gauge, you mean the jiggler, right? The jiggler, yeah. No, 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 no. The the pressure gauge, yeah, that's the jiggler. You're watching the gauge where the where the pressure is. Right. Let that 10 pounds of pressure or whatever pounds you're using come all the way down to zero. Then you can take off your pressure gauge and you still will get just a little psh, that. Do not leave the canner to completely cool. You want to let all the pressure come off. Then you can open it. I always open it away from me. I learned a better lesson and open it towards me. And I will tell you about that. I open it away from me and I do not immediately take the jars out. I take the lid off because if you don't take the lid off, you'll get a vacuum seal. And now you got trouble when you got that vacuum seal. It takes forever to get that rascal off. But remove it. And I let mine sit maybe five minutes. And then I take my tongs and bring it out over to where I'm going to keep it. And I immediately cover them up. And it's not but just a minute. You hear it ping, 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 ping. And it goes. Another thing that you probably would like to have would be a juicer. The juicer is really great to use. It's uh, Gary's going to drop a lid in it. It's stainless steel. I bought mine because I had heard some people talking about it. It's 11 quart and it's stainless steel. It almost looks like a bamboo steamer. It comes in three parts. You have handles on all three parts. The bottom part is where you put your water. The second part is where all your juice collects. The top part is where you put whatever you want to juice. It's not limited to fruits and vegetables. 
You can juice chicken necks and get great broth. You can do all your vegetables, get your vegetable broth, your juice broth to make jellies and everything. And it's much more pure. You don't have to strain it. It also has a rubber tubing that comes out of the side that has a clamp on it that once you think you've got a lot, you just bring it over and let it empty and then you let it keep juicing. I'm saying that probably on an average, it takes 20 to 25 minutes to juice. And what it does, it breaks down the molecules and it brings it right down and it's just pure. Again, here's something that I do at the end of every canning season. I wash it out real good. I clean the rubber hosing out. I make sure everything's clean and dry before I put it up. That's a not a have to have, but it is a thing to have. Another thing that I wanted to talk about was a food meal. Again, this is not a have to have, but it's really a great thing to have. Gary will drop the link for it. It's stainless steel also, and it has two hooks that you can put across a pot. I use mine a lot when I'm making apple butter. I don't make apple butter like a lot of people do in their crock pot. My apple butter cooks at least six to eight hours on the stove. And I just take my whole apples, I drop them in there after they've cooked, and this thing goes round and round. It has a blade on the inside to help push the fruit out. Every once in a while, I give it a backwards turn. And when you turn it, it, it lifts everything off the holes in the bottom so it can go through. This thing is really great. And this belonged to my grandmother, the one that I have. And I think she gave 20 or $30, 25 or 30 years ago for this. It was slightly expensive, but it is well worth it. Now, again, the price on this is high. It's going to be high because everything's naturally gone up through the years. I want to tell you another thing about your canning jars. I learned the very hard way I was canning some chicken broth that I had juiced, but I was pressuring it in my canner. And I had bought some mainstay jars from Walmart. They were very reasonable. So I said, okay, we'll give them a try. I had great success with them until I did the broth. And when I did the broth and I opened my canner, I did everything by the book. I did not hurry the situation. I let it do what it was supposed to be. So I lifted the lid and something should have told me not to reach in with the tongs to remove it because I heard a little hiss and I thought, that's some air escaping. You know, they're going to seal. When I brought one of those jars up, it exploded, exploded into my face top of my face, into my hairline, all across my stomach, and there I stood. And I, you talking about hot. It was so hot, I didn't think I was going to make it. Being a diabetic, I automatically said, I've got to go to the emergency room. Well, Gary was working, so my sister took me. And when I got there, I walked in. I said, I'm diabetic. I've been burned. These are going to be third-degree burns because this was a pressure canner, and the jars exploded on me, and I've got to see a doctor now. So immediately they iced me down, took me back. My sister called Gary and scared him to death. I finally had to take the phone from her because all he said is, Oh God, boo, are you hurt? I can't stand the thoughts of you being hurt. Naturally, I was burned, but I was okay. I made it through. So did a little research. And mainstay jars are made in China. And they're real low quality. If you'll look at some of your regular mason jars like Kerr, Ball, they're all very thick and they're molding look well. A mainstay's jar does not have that. You can even see some tiny air bubbles in the sample. I do have some mainstays and what I'll use them for is my oven cannon and my dry foods that I put up. I would suggest anybody to stay with ball or curb, but let me tell you something else. I bought some golden harvest mason jars. They are from the Dollar General. I don't know if y'all have Dollar Generals where you are or not. But this company that makes Ball and Kerr makes these Golden Harvest for the Dollar General. That's the Dollar General brand. And they are really good. And let me suggest to you that anything that you buy, be it jars, utensils, or cannery, a juicer, a food meal, that's an investment into your future because you're going to use those jars over and over. You're going to use those rings over and over. You're going to use your canner over and over, your juicer, your other equipment. 
So it doesn't matter that you're involved in some money. It's going to pay off in the long run. You don't want nothing cheap that's going to break this type of thing. Let me touch on real quick. Now, water bath you can do. You can water bath. I forgot to touch on that. You can get this this galvanized looking pot and you can water bath. You can water bath jellies and juices. That's good. You can put those up. But with the oven cannon, somebody said, you don't do that. Yeah, I do. Let me tell you how you can do oven cannon. Remember the three twos. You take your jars and you put them in the oven for 20 minutes on 220 degrees. You take those jars out and you fill them with what you want to fill them with. Cornmeal, flour, sugar, salt, baking powder, yeast, whatever. You put the lids on and the seals. You put them back in the oven, still on 220 for 20 more minutes. When you take those out, set them on the cabinet, cover them, those will ping and they will be very, very good. I mean, people just don't believe that you can do that. I even can biscuit. And it's really handy to come in and open up and have that. You can just get that right there. I want to remind you again that mainstays are from Walmart, and they're made in China. So don't invest in those too much with that length of time that you're going to be canning because they do break. They make great crafts. They're good to put cakes in a jar. You've seen these people that stack these things, gifts in a jar. They're great for that. But for canning, I wouldn't do anything except ball curl, golden harvest. Those are great. I know I kind of went through that, but let me tell you one thing that we do. And my great-grandmother did this. My mother did it, and I've done it. Sausage. You're going to fry your sausage out in a black cast iron frying pan. You need wide mouth jars to do this now. Get your quart jar, put your sausage patties down in that jar. What you fry them in, the grease you fry them in, take that grease, pour it down in the jar, put your lid on it and your screw wing, turn it upside down, and it seals. People will say, oh my God, I don't believe you did that. I can't believe you're eating that. Let me tell you something. I've been eating that my entire life. My mother ate it her entire life. My grandmother did it. My great-grandmother did it. It's not going to kill you. It depends on how clean you are with your jars. Clean those jars good. Soap and water, universal precautions. If you want to boil them in hot water, you can. Just be sure that you're clean. Now, I am done ratting and rattling because we're about out of time. But if anybody has any questions... Holler at me. Let's answer a few. I think that, you know, let's let's assume that a listener has never heard of canning and they don't even know what it does exactly and why you would do it. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but when you're doing the canning, you're actually cooking and sealing the food in a sterile environment, right? That's right. You're You're preparing your meals for the future. Right. And about how long do you think, like, say, we canned... We grew a bunch of uh, pole beans and canned the pole beans. About how long do you think those would last? They're good for seven to eight years. Okay. And why would someone want to do that? Prepping. Survival. Yeah. Right. We also talked about canning water. You can can water, and it wouldn't hurt to have the – you might could do those in the mainstay. I don't know. I just – mainstay kind of scares me. I just do that for the oven cooking. Yeah, another thing you could probably do is if you wanted to put your flour and cornmeal and things like that in, in something, your dry stuff, you, you know, the mainstay would probably be okay for that. As far as ensuring that you have a perfect seal and making sure that it doesn't blow up in your face, probably That's right. want to stay away from that. Rob Works put something in the chat room that is so true. Sterilization is the key. If you're clean to begin with, you're not going to lose anything. Very seldom. The only time that I've seen anything really go bad was a tomato one time. And I think my friend, you know, she went on, oh, God, and she learned to can. She was canning anything, everything. She put some tomatoes, and she called me, and she said, what does it mean when all the tomatoes come to the top of the jar? I said, throw them out. Right. And she said, well, how, how do you know they're bad? I said, open them up. It'll tell you. And she opened them up, and she gagged and vomited and everything else, and her husband had to carry them out. Poor Patsy. 
<laughs> I mean, you know, it's just really bad. But yeah, we have to be careful. And and I guess the last thing, just kind of trip down memory lane. There used to be a time when canneries were very accessible, just about everywhere in high schools, most places across the country. But that's not true anymore, Where is it, Gigi's been? No, a mother said that when she was in high school in the 60s, they had a FHA department, Future Homemakers of America, and a FFA department, Future Farmers of America. So the, the FFA and FHA helped all summer long with the people who came in and canned their food. And she said, you started out, you put every, yours in the can, and you had to wait till it went through one process. And then it went through another process and somebody could put theirs in when somebody in front of them went to the second process. And she said, you marked them when they came out so you knew what you had and everything was put up. Right. I don't see people. I think people are too lazy to do anything like that now. Well, they're too lazy to grow their own food. And that's that's where this all ties together, that if you're going to have a garden and grow a significant quantity of stuff. You have to have ways of preserving it. And canning is one of those very main ways of doing it. And since mm-hmm. the, since there aren't canneries anymore, it behooves one to learn how to do it on one's own. It's really not that difficult. You just have to go follow the follow the process and be very careful. You know, safety first. I wouldn't even what, what year was it, Gary, that I made all that strawberry jam? I was just dragging. I think I put up 90 half pints of blueberry jam and 120 half pints of strawberry jam. And it took me two and a half days. We're still eating the strawberry and the blueberry. Right. And, and Rob Works makes a good point in the chat room. And they, they have to pop. They have to seal. And when you open the lid, it'll hiss. You don't necessarily have to pop, but you can hear it break the seal. Yeah, that that means that your vacuum mm-hmm. is, is still good. So, yeah, very good stuff. Now, and one other thing that came up, in, at least in my mind, you were talking about the uh, juicer. Mm-hmm. And then we talked about the water bath. And let's be, be, just be specific here. And you can actually juice a whole lot of stuff and put it into jars and then and water, water bath it. and water bath those jars. Mm-hmm. And it, we didn't talk too much about the process of water bathing. You want, you want to talk about what happens? Sure. Water bathing is just mainly you put it in the jars and you water bath. It. You bring it, you tighten it, you know, you tighten your lids and everything on. And I always bring it up, up to the neck of the jar or if it's a pint a little over the jar. And for my fruits and things, I just kind of go by a, whatever it says the recipe says, and I think it's right. I'll, if I'm going to do jellies and jams and all that, I water bath all my jellies for at least 15 minutes. And then you let it cool down. And, and the juice, too. And it'll ping, too. So, you know. Yeah, they'll ping. Yeah. And Rob, uh, Rob, Rob yeah, works, he said he correct? Yeah, jelly. Yeah. Uh-huh. Ten mm-hmm. years old. Mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong. I yeah. had a friend who was an elderly lady, and she and her husband had a what we call a root cellar, spring house. And she was down, and she found some pears, and she had wrote the date on them. She canned those pears in the 1950s, and she opened them up, and they tasted just as fresh and as good as if they had come off the tree. A lot of people didn't want to taste them. I tasted them. I wasn't afraid of them. You could probably tell <laughs> if there was something wrong with oh, it. Oh, yeah. You would know. Oh, yeah. And the uh, as Rob also points out, that you want to store those in the dark. And that's what root cellars and dairies and, and basements and things like that are for. You keep your stuff in a, in a temperature-controlled environment that isn't yeah. real, doesn't get real warm, doesn't get real cold, certainly. You don't want to, yeah, you don't want to change temperature too much. Right. You certainly yeah. don't want it to freeze, so they'll explode. But anyway, I think that covered it real well. Thanks, Gigi's Boo. Is there anything else about that? I'm sorry, I'm sorry I said doo-doo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I heard it. We don't <laughs> can doo-doo. It ain't no doo-doo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anything else you want to add before we head out of here, Gigi's Boo? I love you big to my heart. I love you. And I remember, always take the road less traveled.
Take the road less traveled, as Gigi Boo was saying. I miscued on that. But I don't know, kind of caught me a little bit of a rush, but don't really, don't really need to be because I usually edit out at least five minutes of the shows, although this one seemed to go pretty well. And we thank you for listening, and we hope that you join us again next, next week here on reallibertymedia.com, RLM Radio, for the road less traveled. See you next time. Bye-bye.